Welcome to Respiratory Virtual Grand Rounds. I'm Dr. Raed Dweig, Director of the CME Activity and Director of the Pulmonary Vascular Program at the Cleveland Clinic. These Grand Rounds are case-based presentations where I invite some of the leading authorities in the field of respiratory medicine to discuss an important topic that I believe is worthwhile to your practice in order to help you be more confident in approaching and managing your patients. For today's presentation, I have asked Dr. Barry Make to provide you with an update on the management of COPD. Dr. Barry Make is Professor of Medicine in the Division of Pulmonary Sciences and Critical Care Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He is co-director of the COPD program and director of pulmonary rehabilitation and respiratory care at National Jewish Health. Dr. Make earned his Doctor of Medicine degree from Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He completed his internship in internal medicine at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, also in Philadelphia, and his residency in internal medicine at the University of Michigan Medical Center in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Dr. Make obtained his pulmonary medicine fellowship training at West Virginia University School of Medicine in Morgantown, West Virginia, and Boston University School of Medicine in Boston. Dr. Make frequently speaks on the topic of COPD at national and international meetings and has been the Jean Wald Bennett Visiting Professor for COPD Education Day at Cleveland Clinic in 2011. Dr. Make served on, co-chaired, or chaired several workshops and committees on COPD and is currently treasurer of the COPD Coalition and a member of the COPD Foundation Medical and Scientific Advisory Committee. Dr. Make is a fellow of the American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehabilitation, the American College of Chest Physicians, and the American College of Physicians. And he is a member of several professional societies, including the American Association for Respiratory Care, American Federation for Clinical Research, and the American Thoracic Society. Dr. Make's case-based presentation has built-in audience response questions that are designed to help you test your knowledge as you follow along. Here's Dr. Make. Thank you very much, and thank you for participating in today's session called Management of COPD. I'm going to provide an update of this very important topic that should be useful in your clinical practice. Here are my financial disclosures. I've been an advisory board member, a consultant, or a participant in multi-center trial for the following that appear on this slide. We're going to approach this a little bit differently than you may have heard before. In order to understand the management of COPD, I think it's important that you think about the clinical features in each patient with COPD that you see, because as we know, one patient isn't necessarily like another one. And what are the individual features of each patient that allow us to incorporate personalized medicine into our approach in the management of patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? The next learning objective will be to describe the pharmacologic options for patients with COPD that achieve outcomes that are important to our patients. The third is to list key non-pharmacologic therapy that will achieve options in patients with COPD. We'll start with a case of Mrs. C.D. Chief complaint that she comes in with, this 58-year-old woman, presents with difficulty keeping up with her 5-year-old grandson. Uh, she cares for her grandson five, three days a week while her daughter is working, and she's concerned because, you know, he's running around all over the place and she can't keep up with him, and she's concerned that that may be harmful to him at some point. She also, when you ask her carefully, walks slower than people of the same age on level ground because of breathlessness. She can't keep up with her husband, for example. She has hypertension that you've seen her for before, and she's on metoprolol for that. She has high cholesterol. She's on simvastatin for treatment for that. And she's overweight with a BMI of 32 that she says is related to when she started to go through uh, menopause. She has no chest discomfort or pain with activity, uh, no, short, no uh, edema or palpitations. She uh, is a former cigarette smoker. She smoked 39 years, uh, one pack per day, uh, and stopped uh, a year ago. Uh, she currently, however, is using e-cigarettes. You may be hearing a lot about e-cigarettes from the FDA. Her EKG shows sinus rhythm and no other STT changes or abnormalities, no heart block. Her blood count shows a normal hemoglobin and hematocrit. White count slightly elevated 11,000, normal differential. Her spirometry shows an FEV1 FVC ratio. Now that means the forced expired volume to the forced vital capacity, that ratio, 
is 0.54. Normal values are greater than or equal to 0 0.70. Her FEV1, that is the absolute amount of air that she gets out in one second, the first second of a maximal exhalation, is 50% of predicted, and normal is 80% or more. Her forced vital capacity, the total amount of air that she can blow out during the spirometry maneuver, is 72% of predicted. Again, normal is greater than 80%. Her chest X-ray shows uh, no uh, infiltrates, uh, no masses, nothing that looks like uh, lung cancer, nothing that looks like a pneumonia. Certainly, it doesn't explain her shortness of breath. Cardiac silhouette uh, is normal. So the first thing we need to think about in this patient is assessing first whether she has COPD and then how bad it is and then whether we can apply personalized therapy. So what's the purpose of the assessment? First, to make a correct diagnosis. Spirometry is imperative because the definition of COPD is airflow limitation. Now, if a patient comes in and a patient is wheezing, well, that doesn't mean there's necessarily airflow limitation because patients who are healthy and young, if they blow out hard enough, you can hear wheezes once in a while, or they may have upper airway obstruction or something else. Uh, and if a patient uh, looks relatively healthy and has no other physical signs that look like COPD and you're not sure of the history, spirometry is imperative. It's important to make a diagnosis. In fact, it's one of the quality metrics for primary care. If you have a diagnosis of COPD in the chart, you need to have a spirometry. Now, what else does the assessment do? Well, the assessment is important in terms of the symptoms, history of exacerbations, and spirometry and a couple other features as well. Let's go through these uh, specifically on the next slide. What's most important in terms of symptoms? The symptom patients usually report to us is shortness of breath or dyspnea. Now, how bad is that dyspnea? Well, in this patient, for example, remember she had trouble playing with her grandson. Well, that's kind of hard to gauge the severity on the basis of that. But there was something else in her history. She walked slower than her husband, slower than people of her own age on level ground, it turns out that's a symptom that we know about, and that defines her symptoms uh, severity for shortness of breath. Now, in the office setting, you may also want to ask other questions about how short of breath she is, so you can ask those questions not just on the first visit, but on repeated visits to know whether the shortness of breath is getting better. Uh, for example, uh, what does the patient have trouble with in her daily life? Do they have stairs they have to walk up uh, every day to get to the bedroom, and there's shorter breath on one flight of stairs? So certainly assessing the severity of shortness of breath is extremely important. The next thing in terms of severity that's really important is COPD exacerbations. Why? Because COPD exacerbations are very impactful for our patients. What do I mean by impactful? Well, sometimes they lead to hospitalizations, and somebody's hospitalized with COPD, they have a higher risk of death not only during but following the hospitalization for the next year. COPD exacerbations make people feel bad, they increase their symptoms, they may be so severe that they can't participate in their normal activities, and in fact, they may be very frequent as well. So the history of whether it's COPD exacerbations, the patient has had them, and the frequency of the exacerbations are very important in terms of assessing severity. So the more symptoms and the more exacerbations, the worse the disease. Spirometry is another issue that will affect uh, and be a major factor in terms of the severity. That's the spirometric severity. It doesn't correlate perfectly with symptoms and exacerbations, but in general, the worse the spirometry, in terms of the lower the FEV1% predicted, the more symptoms and the more exacerbations people will have. And then in terms of other issues, think about comorbidities that will also impact your patient and impact maybe the ability of uh, medications to help them. For example, if somebody has such severe back pain due to lumbar disc disease that they can't walk because of their back pain, treating their COPD to alleviate their dyspnea won't help because they're still limited by their back pain. And in essence, the assessment of COPD severity by symptoms, exacerbations, and spirometry will help you to personalize therapy. On this slide, you see the three-legged stool, and this is what I call the basis of the severity assessment for patients with COPD. In order to do personalized management at the top of the stool, for somebody to sit on the stool, you need to have three legs, and you need to understand what those legs are. So you need to understand how severe the symptoms are, how severe the spirometry is, and how severe the exacerbation is in terms of trying to personalize the management for each given individual subject. On the next slide, we see 
uh, assessment uh, of COPD outlined a little bit differently. This comes from the COPD Foundation. The COPD Foundation is a nonprofit organization of patients with COPD to encourage more appropriate care and to encourage uh, patients to understand their disease and to learn more about it. And you see the severity domains here in terms of the spirometry grade, the severity of the symptoms, whether they happen regularly or irregularly, exacerbations, oxygenation, presence of emphysema, presence of chronic bronchitis, and comorbidities. So there is published information in these guidelines and recommendations to help us gauge the severity of COPD. Why are some of the other things listed on not this slide and not on the previous slide? Well, it turns out that people who have significant hypoxemia is defined by arresting oxygen saturation of 88% or less, have higher mortality. And those patients will need oxygen therapy, so that's a way to personalize the therapy right away. Patients who have oxygenation better than that don't need oxygen. Uh, people with uh, hypoxemia also not only have more exacerbations, uh, poor prognosis, uh, but they uh, have poor quality of life as well. Turns out that chronic bronchitis, which we don't ask about anymore, chronic bronchitis is the presence of cough and phlegm on most days uh, of the week. If you have cough and sputum production for at least three months in uh, the last two years, those patients have more exacerbations as well. So many of the issues here are important to assess as well in each individual patient. So let's put this together with Mrs. C.D. How severe do you think her COPD is? So I think Mrs. C.D.'s COPD is uh, in the range of uh, moderate to severe. Now, why do I say that? She hasn't had any exacerbations. Uh, at least she didn't tell us about that. And we asked her specifically, and she said, no, I don't have any exacerbations. I haven't needed antibiotics or prednisone for worsening disease. I haven't been in emergency room. I haven't been admitted to the hospital because of my COPD. So that makes her a little less severe. If you look at her spirometry, her FEV1 is 50% of predicted, which actually for spirometry stage is exactly in the middle between moderate and severe. That defines the distinction between moderate and severe in terms of the airflow limitation. What about her walking and, breath, walking and her shortness of breath? Remember, she walks slower than people over the same age on level ground because of breathlessness, and that's also in the moderate to severe range. So that's why I'm suggesting that in Mrs. C.D., she has moderate to severe COPD. Well, Mrs. C.D., we know has COPD. We know she has symptoms. Uh, chest X-ray didn't show anything. Would you order a chest CT scan? Possible answers are, one, no, a CT scan is not medically indicated. Two, yes, it is to detect the presence of emphysema because that's a marker of severity. Three, yes, to exclude other lung diseases other than COPD may have bronchiectasis, may have asthma. Now, uh, asthma can't be diagnosed on CT scan, but bronchiectasis could be. Or four, yes, to rule out lung cancer. What's your answer? My answer would be number four, and that's because the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, as well as most professional organizations, including oncology, pulmonology, primary care, have suggested that the results of the lung cancer screening trial reported a couple of years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine should be extended to the general population. That is, people who have a history of smoking stopped, uh, this patient has uh, stopped only about a year ago, stopped less than 15 years ago in this age range that Mrs. C.D. is, she's 58, should have a CT scan, a low-dose CT scan to rule out lung cancer. I'd like to suggest that we certainly want to look for the presence of emphysema because that's a marker of severity as well, and we might also want to exclude lung disease, other lung diseases. Those are clinical uh, uh, things that you need to think about, potential clinical implications. But clearly the answer that everybody would suggest is uh, correct is number four, making sure she doesn't have lung cancer. Chest X-ray alone is not helpful to do that. In fact, uh, uh, studies have shown that uh, chest CT scan is more beneficial than uh, chest X-ray alone to exclude lung cancer in patients who are high risk like this patient. So what are our choices for pharmacotherapy? Well, bronchodilators are key to symptom management, and they are on the slide and should be extremely prominent. However, we need to remember that in any patient, smoking, continued smoking, is a risk factor for developing more severe disease. Continued smoking uh, is a risk factor for not only more COPD and faster progression of COPD, 
but for uh, multiple lung cancers, coronary artery disease, a lot of other adverse health consequences. So certainly smoking cessation should be the first therapy. And when you uh, suggest to patients they stop smoking, those three treatments here in terms of pharmacotherapy are important. The continue replacement alone, the continue replacement plus bupropion, or varenicline alone. The most effective of these is varenicline. You certainly might think about that, but don't need to do that, Mrs. CD. She's already stopped smoking. What about bronchodilators? Well, she's symptomatic and has significant symptoms, so long-acting bronchodilators would be preferred for maintenance treatment. This is not a PRN. This is regular treatment. The three choices here are beta agonist bronchodilators, muscarinic antagonist bronchodilators, or there's now a combination to put both those two together in the same inhaler. Another choice would be an inhaled steroid only when combined with a long-acting beta agonist because that's the currently how long-acting beta agonist inhaled steroids are approved in the U.S. for COPD. Inhaled steroids by themselves are not approved for COPD, but they are when combined with long-acting beta agonist. And there are currently three different preparations market. You also want to think about reducing exacerbations. Bronchodilators will help reduce exacerbations and improve shortness of breath. But in somebody who has a lot of exacerbations, and exacerbation reduction only is the, is the uh, key to therapy and the goal of therapy, then PD-4 inhibitor is successful in achieving that outcome. And the antibiotic, although not approved by the FDA, such as azithromycin used chronically for a year, is also uh, uh, in a study published in the New England Journal uh, two years ago, has been shown to reduce exacerbations. So you can see from this slide that you need to start to personalize therapy. This is CD, doesn't have exacerbations, so you wouldn't necessarily think about those PD4 inhibitors or antibiotics, but she is short of breath and she's already stopped smoking, so in her, bronchodilators or inhaled steroids combined with long acting beta agonists would be something you should think about. Well, what about long-acting bronchodilators? Well, there are different ones that are available in the market. The two most commonly used of the older ones are Sometrol and Promotrol, which are twice daily. There's a new once daily Indicatorol that's also approved for use in patients with COPD. They improve lung function and decrease shortness of breath, improve health status, and improve exercise. And that's important because when Mrs. CD runs after her grandson, she's going, to, she's exercising, and she needs to do more activity and bronchodilators, beta agonists, will help in this regard as well. As I mentioned, there's a combination that currently is on the market, recently became available, of a combination long-acting beta agonist with a long-acting muscarinic antagonist together. As seen on this slide, you, uh, this shows the FEV1, that is the lung function, uh, after one day and after 12 weeks, in a group of patients who were in a study comparing placebo and indicatorol, that new once-a-day long-acting beta agonist bronchodilator we talked about. You can see even after the first dose on day one, and that effect persists after week 12, that the improvement in spirometric value in FEV1. So there's no doubt that long-acting beta agonist improve lung function. But our patient isn't going to come in to us and ask about what her lung function is. She's going to know whether she's She's going to want to know whether this is going to improve her shortness of breath. This slide is a, a study looking at uh, placebo and indicatorol again as an example, and this is true of other beta agonists as well, looking at the transitional dyspnea index, which is a measure of shortness of breath. And you can see uh, in week four and week 12 in the two different studies that are reported in this journal article, um, uh, shortness of breath is uh, improved, that is the height of the bar is higher in patients who received indicatorol compared to patients receiving placebo. So long-acting beta agonists improve shortness of breath. In that same article, the two studies looked at uh, health status, that is how people feel. Health status sometimes referred to as disease-specific quality of life. This is change in the St. George Respiratory Questionnaire. And you can see that week four and week 12, uh, compared to placebo, indicatorol in those two studies had a greater decrease in the SGRQ scores. Turns out a decrease in score is better quality of life. So indicatorol compared to placebo health improves health status or health-related quality of life. 
This slide looks at the effects of long-acting muscarinic antagonists, and there are two of those that are currently available in the United States, teotropium, which is once a day, and acladinium, which is a twice-a-day inhaled medication. And you can see that the uh, results of those studies in terms of outcomes are exactly the same as those for beta agonists. They improve lung function, decrease dyspnea, improve health status, and increase exercise. Now, I'm not going to talk about exacerbations uh, with either beta agonist or muscarinic antagonist here because that's not the problem that our patient faces. Our patient mainly uh, is focused on her shortness of breath and her quality of life. In this study, published in Respiratory Research in 2011, looks at a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. This is the newer one, acladinium. Teotropium has similar results. You can see the FEV1 at the end of 24 hours. Uh, in two different studies being better with acladinium in the color bars compared to placebo in the gray bars. So long-acting muscarinic antagonists also improve lung function and those will also improve other outcomes. This is a slide summarizing the long-acting beta agonist effects in patients with COPD, looking at some meterol, formoterol, indicatorol, the three currently available long-acting beta agonists uh, by the inhaled form in patients with COPD, they all, to pretty similar extents, improve lung function, breathlessness, exercise, and quality of life. But what about using both of those agents together, both a long-acting beta agonist and a long-acting muscarinic antagonist? As I mentioned, there is currently one such uh, a combination agent combining two different long-acting bronchodilators that's available, eumeclidinium and verlanterol. This looks at the effects of a combination in the open triangles compared to each individual agent compared to placebo. You can see the, at the top uh, of this graph, you can see the open triangles. So the combination of the mechlidinium and valantrol improved lung function over a period of uh, 169 days, uh, about uh, half a year, uh, more than each of the individual agents alone and certainly more than placebo. So combining agents is better than using either agent alone. What would you suggest that misses CD? Should you use one agent or two agents? Well, that depends on your individual choice and how bad you think your symptoms are. You could start with one agent alone, a beta agonist or an antimuscarinic antagonist, and then maybe add a second one or add, change the patient to the combination depending on her response. So Mrs. CD comes back a year later and at that time, you prescribed a long-acting beta agonist only, and she was, uh, had less shortness of breath, and she was uh, comfortable in her symptoms. But she returns that one year for a regularly scheduled appointment, and uh, you find out, although you didn't know this, nobody sent you the record, she was hospitalized two months ago. At that time, she had more shortness of breath. She also had cough, more sputum production, which were new symptoms for her. So that's defined as a COPD exacerbation worsening symptoms requiring uh, a change in therapy. So now that she's had an exacerbation, would you consider her a different kind of patient and different needs? You've addressed her shortness of breath and she's successfully uh, uh, being able to be more active and play with her grandson and feels comfortable doing that. But now that she's had an exacerbation, would you add or change therapy? So here's the choices. Would you add a long-acting muscarinic antagonist would you keep her, would you uh, change her long acting beta agonist to a long acting beta agonist inhaled steroid combination? Would you add a PD4 inhibitor? Would you add azithromycin? Would you choose none of the above? Or would you choose maybe some combination of different ones above? What is your answer? So Mrs. CD is already a long-acting beta agonist, and that obviously is not enough to reduce her exacerbations. So I think there are several choices here. You could add maybe a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, knowing that there is a further reduction in exacerbations on both those, or you could use a long-acting muscarinic antagonist along with a long-acting beta agonist in a single agent. You could change your long-acting beta agonist to a long-acting beta agonist combined with an inhaled steroid, and the inhaled steroid does reduce exacerbations further. You could keep her a long-acting beta agonist and say, well, uh, I might want to use a PD-4 inhibitor. I think that's not going to be a good choice because 
From what we know before, this patient does not have chronic cough and sputum production. She only had it at the time of the hospitalization, so that would not be a reasonable choice. How about azithromycin once a day, 250 milligrams? Well, that's another option. You can keep her on a long-acting bad agonist and add another agent to try to reduce exacerbations. So I think there are several choices here. One might be okay, two might be okay, and number four might be okay. So in terms of exacerbation reduction choices, here's the choices. And all these have been shown to reduce exacerbation, as we just discussed. The hailed beta agonist, long-acting, long-acting muscarinic antagonist, combination of those two, inhaled steroid combined with the long-acting beta agonist, and those two oral agents. So they're all potential choices. And we discussed why some of them might or might not be appropriate in Mrs. CD. Let's look at some of the information that will help us decide uh, and uh, inform us that exacerbations can be reduced by these medications. Here's a slide from a long-term study of three years of teotropium. This is the Uplift trial published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2008. And it shows that teotropium reduces exacerbations. Here we graph the probability of exacerbations, the percent of patients that have exacerbations uh, on the y-axis. Uh, you see on the x-axis, this study actually goes out to four years. In the uh, dotted line, you see placebo. And in the pink line, the pink solid line, you see a teotropium. You see the teotropium has less exacerbations, and it turns out in this trial there was a 14% reduction in exacerbations. It's important to mention that placebo, these placebo patients also were allowed to take other medications, and many of them had long-acting beta agonists and inhaled steroids alone. So teotropium as an add-on therapy reduces exacerbations, and that's why that might be an appropriate choice in Mrs. CD. What about a combination of an inhaled steroid long-acting beta agonist? This slide looks at a combination of flutixone and salmeterol in patients with moderate to severe COPD exacerbations and uh, compared to some metrol, the long-acting bronchodilator alone. The two bars represent the exacerbation rates, the number of exacerbations per patient per year. Patients on some metrol only, they had 1.53 exacerbations, and patients on the combination inhaled steroid, long-acting beta agonist, they had a reduction in exacerbations of about 30%. So that's why a choice in Mrs. CD might be to add to her long-acting beta agonist, a long act, uh, instead of that, replacing with a combination of a long-acting beta agonist and inhaled steroid. What about one long-acting agent compared to another long-acting bronchodilator? This slide is from the New England Journal of Medicine article in 2011 comparing teotropium, a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, to a long-acting beta agonist submeterol to prevent COPD exacerbations. This slide suggests that teotropium is better than submeterol in reducing exacerbations. So a choice in Mrs. CD might be to change our submeterol to teotropium alone. Well, there are other things that are important in our patients as well, not only exacerbations, but also mortality. This slide looks at a retrospective uh, series of patients from the Scottish National Health Service. And from this database, they called 1,857 patients who were on a combination of three different agents, long-acting anticholinergic or muscarinic antagonist, an inhaled steroid, and long-acting beta agonist. They compared that group of patients to 996 COPD patients from the same retrospective database who are only on an inhaled steroid long-acting beta agonist. This slide suggests that people on triple therapy actually had a reduction in hospital admissions compared to patients who are only on the long-acting beta agonist inhaled steroid alone. So you can see that there are multiple choices for, uh, for Mrs. CD, even when she comes back and she's worse in terms of more exacerbations. She can be single agents, combinations of agents, and then all three agents together. Now, we talked about uh, another uh, possible agent uh, to reduce exacerbations, and that's reflumolast. But as I indicated, it might not be appropriate for Mrs. CD, and here's why. In the reflumolast studies, patients that were enrolled who were current or former smokers, that would be true of Mrs. CD, who had severe to very severe COPD, and that is an FEV1 of less than 50% are predicted, and that Mrs. CD certainly qualifies there as well. Patients also had chronic bronchitis. Here's where Mrs. CD does not qualify. She did not have chronic cough and sputum production. 
and it will also enroll patients who had a history of a COPD exacerbation. So that would qualify Mrs. CD as well. So Mrs. CD only has two of these three indications for reflumolase. She has severe COPD, the first one. She has the third one, a history of exacerbations, but she does not have chronic bronchitis, and therefore she would not be a candidate for reflumolase therapy. The next slide shows you the data concerning reflumolase in terms of reducing exacerbations. You can see patients on placebo in the gray bar had 1.37 exacerbations per year, and patients on reflumolase had 1.14 exacerbations per year. This would suggest, as seen on the right-hand slide, in these two different trials reported here, in the first trial, you would need to treat 5.2 patients, and the second trial, 3.64 patients per year with reflumolase to have one reduction in exacerbation. Now, you might say one reduction in exacerbation, that's not a lot. Well, for each individual patient, that's really important. Mrs. CD, if she had one less exacerbation, wouldn't have to take time away from her grandchild. She'd be more involved in activities. I think she would like to have a reduction in exacerbations. But again, she doesn't qualify for this therapy. What about chronic antibiotic treatment? Well, azithromycin, uh, used for one year, reported was a 27% reduction in exacerbations. And this was in patients who were on other therapy. Other therapy was allowed. These patients often weren't long-acting muscarinic antagonists, long-acting beta agonists, and inhaled steroids. And azithromycin used regularly 250 milligrams a day for a year had a significant reduction in exacerbations. I need to add that azithromycin is not FDA approved because this was not an FDA study. This was generic uh, azithromycin was used in this study. Uh, and uh, we think uh, from the COPD Clinical Research Network from the National Institutes of Health that did this study, and we were one of the sites in this study, this is a very effective possible potential therapy for Mrs. CD. Let me go back and rethink with you the COPD assessment. This is a very complicated slide. It comes from the GOLD COPD recommendations. GOLD stands for the Global Obstructive Lung Disease Consortium of Experts that put this together. And I find this more complicated than the three-legged stool, but if you think about the three sides of this uh, graphic and uh, the square, on the left being the COPD classification based on spirometry, the COPD symptoms on the bottom, and on the right-hand side, the exacerbation history, you can see you can place patients in four different quadrants in this box based upon the severity of their symptoms, the severity of the airflow limitation, and number of exacerbations they have. So you may see this more commonly uh, in the future because this was just published in 2013 for the first time and updated in 2014 as another way to assess COPD. But we already showed you this, but I want to show you this slide because you're going to see this a lot more uh, as this publication becomes more known uh, throughout the world. Based on the gold COPD assessment in those four different quadrants, there are, depending on whether the patient is quadrant A, B, C, or D, specific recommendations for first or second alternative choices for different agents. This, again, is a much more complicated system than I presented to you. It shows you there's other information in the literature and recommendations to support what we've talked about. What about non-pharmacologic therapy? Well, non-pharmacologic therapy is extremely important in patients with COPD as well. Influenza and pneumococcal vaccine is recommended in all patients with COPD. You may be aware of the pneumococcal vaccine recommendations, which generally say that people over age 60 or 65 should receive pneumococcal vaccine, but if patients who have COPD are higher risk for pneumonia, and all those patients should be uh, uh, vaccinated with pneumococcal vaccine no matter their age. We talked about the benefits of smoking cessation. Oxygen therapy is extremely important, mainly because it improves survival with marked hypoxemia defined as a resting oxygen saturation of 88% or less. What about pulmonary rehabilitation? What is rehabilitation of the lungs? Pulmonary rehabilitation is a comprehensive program of exercise and education. Turns out when patients exercise regularly, the benefits are probably greater than those achieved by medications alone in terms of reducing shortness of breath, improving quality of life, reducing exacerbations, and improving exercise. All patients with COPD are candidates for this kind of program. 
There's another more drastic kind of therapy, and that's a surgical therapy called lung volume reduction surgery. This is reserved for patients with emphysema of moderate to severe on CT scan, and generally those with upper lobe predominant emphysema. It can improve survival, exercise, quality of life, and exacerbations, but people need to be very, very carefully assessed to see their candidacy for this potential therapy. The last surgical therapy I did not include in this slide is, is a lung transplant, and that should be reserved for the most severe patients uh, and certainly need a pulmonary consultant and a thoracic surgeon uh, experienced lung transplant team to evaluate your patient. So in summary, what have we talked about? Well, I hope I've given you an idea how to personalize the therapy for COPD for each different patient. In patients who have more symptoms, that may be a major goal of therapy, and we talked about long-acting beta agonists, long-acting muscarinic antagonists, pulmonary rehabilitation, uh, in terms of improving dyspnea exercise and health status. This is CD, certainly fell into that realm when we first saw her. When we saw her a year later, our goals were changed, and our personalized medicine would say, well, now it's just as important, if not more important, to make sure that we reduce exacerbations. And we've talked about bad approaches to doing that. The pharmacologic therapies that are available should be ta tailored to each individual patient. And each individual patient may need different medications based on their response and on the features they present with. Non-pharmacologic therapies should also be tailored to each individual patient in our personalized medicine approach for COPD. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. In this presentation, Dr. Make used a clinical case to illustrate the clinical features that need to be considered when providing personalized medicine in the management of COPD patients. He emphasized the importance of symptom assessment, history of exacerbations, and spirometry in the evaluation of these patients. Dr. Meek used the findings from several key recent clinical trials to give an update on the pharmacologic therapeutic options that are currently available to help achieve outcomes of importance to patients with COPD. He also provided information about key non-pharmacologic therapeutic options that can help achieve these clinically important outcomes. Dr. Meek also briefly discussed the recently updated GOLD recommendations and emphasize the importance of smoking cessation and screening for lung cancer in eligible individuals based on the current lung cancer screening guidelines. I hope that you found Dr. Make's presentation on the management of COPD to be a useful update on this topic and that it would help you with the day-to-day -day management of these patients in your practice. Finally, on behalf of myself, Dr. Make, the Respiratory Institute, and the Cleveland Clinic, I would like to thank you for listening to this respiratory virtual Grand Rounds presentation.